Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today for our Denison webinar, New Findings in Culture and Leadership, How Denison Research Can Help You Enhance Your Engagement. My name is Karen Luce. I'm in charge of learning and development here at Denison Consulting, and I am your host for today's webinar. We are very excited to be able to feature our research department today. Uh, they're going to talk with us about how um, the, our research department can help you with your clients and consultants uh, to enhance your engagement. And also they're going to discuss some of the new projects, the research projects that they've been working on. Before we get started, I want to go on over just a couple of technical things with you. Um, we're going to present for about 40 minutes. Um, and we'll use the remainder of our time to go over some of the questions that have been sent in by you, our audience. On the right-hand side of the screen, you're going to see a control panel. You can use that to send in your questions. We ask that you send in your questions at any time during the presentation today. Um, and please send them in throughout the presentation. That way we have a chance to organize them and um, get them ready for our, um, for our, our researchers during the presentation, and that way we can make the most of our um, question and answer session. If we don't get to your specific question, I do apologize. We will make every effort to follow up with you after the webinar. I also want to make every, everyone um, aware that a copy of today's webinar and the slides that we're presenting are going to be archived on our website. So if you'd like to see them again, you'll be able to access them. And we will send you all an email once they are available. So now we'd like to get started. I would like to introduce to you two of our researchers. Uh, Dr. Lindsay Koderba is the director of Denison's Research and Development Department. She comes to us from Wayne State University with a PhD in Industrial and Organizational Psychology. She's an active researcher and publishes and speaks regularly on behalf of Denison Consulting. Her primary uh, research interests include gender and leadership, aging in the workplace, measurement, and job satisfaction. Joining Lindsay, we have Dr. Ashley Giedros. Uh, she's a senior research consultant here at Denison. She earned her PhD in organization, industrial and organizational psychology from Bowling Green State University. She's also an active speaker and writer. And her primary research interests are um, organizational culture and healthcare, workplace diversity, conflict in the workplace, and judge department, a thriving department at Denison. And we are happy to have them both with us today. With that, I would like to turn the mic over to Dr. Lindsay Koderba to start us out. Thank you, Karen. Um, I'd like to start by um, providing a little bit of an overview of really what it is that we do here in the R&D department at Denison Consulting, um, give you a little bit of insight into our services and our capabilities and, and what it is that we have to offer. Um, and then after that overview, myself and my colleague Ashley Guidros are going to be taking a little bit of a closer look at um, some of our more recent research studies, um, providing you with a little bit more information on um, some of our more recent research findings in the areas of both leadership and organizational culture. Um, so with that, um, one of the very important roles for us here in R&D is to look out into the market and into the research literature to gain an understanding of um, what the hot topics and current trends are in the fields of organizational culture and leadership or leadership development. Um, what are the questions our clients and consultants are asking or facing? Um, what questions are being asked in the research literature? And then utilizing our extensive database to answer those types of questions. Um, this not only helps us answer the questions our clients are facing in an educated way, but also makes sure that we are current with the trends in the field and helps to continue to demonstrate the validity of the tools that we offer in a, in a meaningful way. Um, we've submitted somewhere around 10 articles for publication over the last two years. Um, and I've included on this slide a couple of examples of papers that are currently under review um, at Cross-Cultural Management, Organization Science, um, and the Journal of Business and Psychology. Um, you can find all of our publications on the resources section of our website. 
So in addition, we're also frequently presenting our research findings at various conferences throughout the year. So for example, at the Society for Industrial and Organizational Psychology's annual conference this past April, we had three different presentations. Um, we were part of a symposium in which we presented some research looking at the um, effects of age and gender on perceptions of leadership. And this is actually one of the studies that I'll be talking a little bit um, more, talking about in a little bit more detail a little bit later on in the webinar. Um, we were also part of a um, high energy and very informative uh, debate on innovation with some leading scholars in the field, um, and as well as presenting a poster on um, detecting careless or random responders um, in employee surveys. Uh, more recently, um, at the Academy of Management's annual conference, which just wrapped up a couple of weeks ago in Montreal, um, we were part of two different sessions there. Uh, a part we were part of a session on executive coaching where we were specifically talking about the utilization of peer coaching networks, um, as well as being part of a session exploring um, how to best utilize older employees in the workplace. Um, I also want to mention that each quarter we write and release what we call research notes, um, which are short three to four page write-ups of all of our research findings. Um, that describe our research findings in a concise and easy to read way. Um, these can be really useful resources um, and they're also all available on the resources section of the Denison website. Another very important part of what R&D does here at Denison is client support and client driven research. So I wanted to briefly go over some of the more um, frequent client services that, that we provide. So often our clients are interested in measuring other constructs such as safety or sustainability in addition to um, our standard assessments that we provide. So in these cases, if um, clients come to us with questions that they've already written, um, we can help review these custom questions and provide feedback um, and provide suggestions or we can um, kind of start from scratch with the client to develop a set of questions that will measure a topic in a meaningful and useful way. Um, also, our clients have um, also often deployed other types of surveys in their organizations, either previously or concurrently with the Denison tools. Um, and we can do a qualitative and potentially a quantitative mapping of those other surveys to the Denison model. So letting clients know which concepts might be overlapping in terms of you know, what we assess in the Denison model and what they're, they're currently assessing or have assessed in the past, um, or what's unique between the two surveys, what new information will be, will be gained. Um, in addition to those types of services, um, when clients do ask custom questions on the survey, we don't have external benchmarks that are, are available, but we can work with clients to calculate internal benchmarks um, uh, for those custom questions. Uh, we've also been involved in um, a lot of qualitative analysis and content coding of open-ended questions um, and can provide um, detailed and useful reports um, that can help uh, organizations um, better understand or make sense out of you know, large amounts of responses to open-ended questions. Um, we've also been involved in working with organizations to determine um, sampling plans um, when, when the organization isn't using a census um, to make sure that the organization is sampling in a way that uh, will um, eventually lead to, to valid results and valid reports. Um, one of the most exciting things that we get to do um, here in the R&D department from, from the client perspective is work with clients to identify business metrics, um, performance outcomes that are important to them, that they're, that they're using to, um, to track improvement in their organization, to track performance in their organization, and work with those organizations to um, help them understand how their culture data or their leadership data relate to those performance metrics. And so um, on that front, I wanted to provide you with a couple of examples of um, these, these more client-driven research projects um, that we conduct, have conducted recently here at Denison just to kind of give you a feel of, um, of some of the custom research we can, we can do with you. So as one example, we had one client in a very male-dominated um, and scientific field um, that was particularly interested in understanding whether there were differences in how male and female leaders in their organization um, were perceived. 
and then potentially using this information to create a development program specifically designed for the women in their organization. Um, and again, this all came out of the idea that you know there are very few women leaders in their organization. They're working in a very male-dominated and scientific role. Um, so is there something that could be done, some information that we could provide them with um, that would help them understand how to potentially um, best develop um, these women leaders? And so we worked with them to conduct a study um, to kind of address these questions and provide this information in a, in a very broad summary of the results are on this slide. When, when we conduct this type of re research, um, we'll, we'll provide kind of a, a detailed technical report as well as a PowerPoint presentation. Um, so you know, this, this one slide is just kind of a broad summary of the results. On the slide that you're looking at, um, the asterisk indicates um, where there were meaningful differences between male and female leaders. Um, in this organization, more particularly with female leaders being rated lower than their male leader um, colleagues. And so as you can see, the Developed Organizational Capability Index of the Denison model is where um, most differences between male and female leaders occurred. So um, we had differences um, with direct reports rating female uh, leaders lower in this area, bosses rating female leaders lower in this area, as well as the combined other profile came out as um, females being rated lower in this area. Another thing that you can, um, so that might indicate that you know, that's a, a particular area that might be important for, the, for women leaders um, in this particular organization to focus on. Another thing that came out is where, for the particular rater group, where most of the differences were, was occurring was for the boss um, rater group. So, um, more than any other raider group, bosses were rating these female leaders um, lower than, than male leaders in the organization, which could be an indication that, um, that these female leaders could utilize, use additional help and support in learning how to manage upwards, um, that they might not be managing upwards effectively, and that might be another area um, um, that they could focus on. Um, as another example, um, we had a client who was interested in understanding how culture related to EBITDA, um, which is a financial performance metric that was important to them um, and that they used to assess the success of different groups in their organization. So looking at the slide, um, the profile on the left is from areas of the organization that saw EBITDA decrease from 2008 to 2009. And the profile on the right is from areas that saw a 50% increase in EBITDA. So just looking at these profiles, so uh, decreased EBITDA to 50% increased EBITDA, um, you can already kind of visually see differences in the culture in general. Um, but looking more specifically, the most dramatic differences are seen in the, the vision index of the mission trait, um, as well as looking at the consistency trait and maybe more specifically in the core values and coordination and integration um, areas of the model. And so providing clients with this, this type of information can be really helpful for organizations in understanding where to focus, which aspects of their organizational culture to focus on um, in order to improve performance and um, help them really guide their action planning efforts. And so um, these are just a, a couple of examples of the client-driven research projects that we've been in, engaged in recently. And we do really, truly enjoy engaging with clients on these types of research projects. Um, and we'd be happy to talk in, in more detail um, with anybody who's interested on that, on that front. So somewhat more speaking to the development side of, of R&D or research and development, our department is also involved in new product development efforts here at Denison. So we're a part of design, we were a big part of designing our new online action planning tool, which uh, a screenshot is, is shown here. Um, this tool was designed to be a place for organizations to track, organize, and, and manage their action planning efforts. And more information about the action planner can be found on our website. Um, as another example of product development that we've been in, engaged in recently, um, we've also developed and released three content modules, which are short, um, reliable, and valid measures um, that are designed to take a deeper dive into topics that are important to our clients um, and that are related to organizational culture. So we currently have three modules available assessing employee engagement, 
um, organizational innovation, as well as organizational trust. Um, these modules have all been through extensive um, reliability and validity testing, pilot testing, um, and they are all designed to be added to our standard culture assessment. In addition, they're all benchmarked measures, so um, results just like our culture survey and our leadership survey are reported back in, a, in an normative way or in comparison to how other organizations are performing in these areas. Um, we're also currently developing um, additional modules to, um, to be added to our culture survey. Um, currently, we're working on a, a commitment module, an organizational commitment module, um, to try to gain some insight, insights into topics such as retention and turnover. Um, and we're also um, looking into developing a, um, in a diversity module as well. Um, finally, uh, our R&D department here is also involved in various product support activities, um, such as assessing and maintaining the quality of our survey translation. Um, currently, our trans we have um, both our culture and leadership surveys, as well as our modules translated into many, many languages. Um, an important part of what we do in R&D is um, maintain those languages as well as assess from a statistical perspective that um, the translations are valid and comparable to the English versions of the surveys, as well as assessing and understanding, um, utilizing local experts to assess and understand um, and make sure that the translations appear valid from their perspective as well, from the survey, um, from the survey taker perspective. Um, we also are conducting regular updates to all of our normative databases, so for culture, for leadership, and for all of our content modules to ensure um, that we have the most up-to-date and useful um, normative benchmarks um, and databases that we can have. Um, and in addition to that, we're continuously updating and creating new support documentation for all of our products, um, as well as for our research that can be used both internally for Dennis and staff here, as well as for external use. Um, so with that, that's kind of the, the broad, big picture overview of really what it is we do here in the R&D department at Denison. Um, and if you'd like more information about any of these types of topics or activities, please feel free to contact me. I'm more than happy to talk with you, um, and my contact information is provided um, on a slide at the end of the presentation. And so with that, I would like to move us into taking a little bit of a closer look at some of our more recent research findings. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the first study we'll talk about um, was recently presented at the annual flyout conference back in April. Uh, and this study looks um, specifically at how age and, age and gender interact to um, impact perceptions of leaders. So just to provide a little bit of background to this study, <clears throat> why we felt it was um, an important study and an interesting topic to, um, to look into, in general, the age of the um, population in most industrialized countries is, is rapidly aging. Um, this general aging of the population has led to um, an aging workforce as well um, and some really new and interesting dynamics in the workplace. Um, Past research on um, looking at older employees has shown, and I think most people would probably intuitively agree as well, that you know individuals in general hold both positive and negative stereotypes of older workers. So, for example, um, older workers are sometimes described as being wise and experienced um, and a great asset to organizations, um, but in other instances are described as being slow, resistant to change. Um, and so a lot of times, depending on the skills or the traits or the position in question, um, people hold you know, both positive and negative biases or stereotypes of older workers. Um, because of these new age dynamics in the workplace, um, we've, had, we've seen a general increase in age diversity among leaders themselves. So, um, you know, there's, there's older leaders, younger leaders, and just general age, more age diversity in general amongst leaders themselves, as well as greater age diversity among the individuals that leaders are managing. Um, and so from that perspective, we thought it would be important to investigate 
whether the age of the leader impacts how, she or she, how he or she is perceived. Um, in addition to kind of the age aspect of this, um, and at the same time, there's been a lot of research looking at whether male and female leaders are perceived differently. Most of the findings from these types of studies have produced mixed findings. So there's instances where females are rated higher than males, other instances where males are rated higher than females. Um, and so there's not a lot of consistency in the, in the literature. And so taking these two concepts together, the age in the workplace as well as the gender in the workplace, um, we thought it would be interesting and important to explore um, how both age and gender interact to impact perceptions of leaders. So, for example, are younger women leaders viewed differently than older women leaders? What about for men? Um, and so kind of with that background in mind, <clears throat> we had two primary research questions we were interested in answering. So the first is, will older leaders be perceived more favorably than younger leaders? Um, and second, are, are there differences between how male and female leaders are perceived that are impacted by the age of that leader? So in order to investigate these questions, um, we pulled a sample of over 3,500 leaders from our larger database of leaders who have utilized our 360 tool. Um, our 360, like our culture assessment, is based on the Denison model, um, which, is, uh, which assesses four broad traits, um, each more specifically measuring three indices. Um, the adaptability trait has to do with the leader's ability to translate the demands of the organizational environment into action. Um, the mission trait um, looks at defining a meaningful long-term direction for the organization. Consistency um, is concerned with the leader's abilities and, and skills and capabilities for providing a central source of integration, control, and coordination within the organization. And when we're looking at involvement, kind of the, the green area of the model, um, what we're really focusing on there is um, building human capital, ownership, and responsibility among the individuals that work within an organization. And so because this is a 360 tool, um, we have both self-perceptions and others' perceptions of leaders. And so in discussing results from this study, I'll first focus on self-perceptions around how leaders are rating themselves. So one of the first results that we see is we had a, a main effect for leader age. Well, what that main effect means when you look a little bit more closely is what we found were leaders over 40 rated themselves significantly higher than leaders under 40 on all four traits of the Denison model. Um, in addition, we, we found that we had main effects for gender. And when we looked a little bit more closely at what that gender main effect was telling us, it was telling us that female leaders rated themselves significantly lower um, than male leaders on specifically the adaptability and mission or the externally focused um, traits of the Denison model. <clears throat> And so those are a couple of interesting findings that I'll elaborate further on um, as we kind of go through all of the results and talk about what the potential implications um, for leadership development of these types of findings could be. So in addition to those main effects, um, we did also see um, some, some interesting interactions. So age and gender interacted um, to impact perceptions of leaders uh, in the consistency trait, and we had moderately significant interactions on involvement in that and adaptability. Um, so what, what does that mean? What are these interactions? Let me take a minute to talk a little bit more about what these interactions actually are showing us. So in looking at the graphs of the interactions, we see some really interesting patterns. Um, because the pattern is very similar across the, the three different traits, involvement, consistency, adaptability that I have um, that I have up here, I'll focus on the consistency graph to describe the findings. So first, in looking at the graphs, um, a couple things to point out. Results for women leaders are on the left and for male leaders are on the right. The dark blue line um, is the line that plots leaders 40 and over, and the light blue line plots leaders 40 and under. So one of the first things that really stood out to me um, after plotting these interactions that I thought was really interesting um, was that if you're looking at, at men, 
um, there's very there's a very small difference between how male leaders over 40 and male leaders under 40 are rating themselves. That difference is pretty small. However, when you're looking at women, that difference gets much, much larger. So women under 40 and women over 40 are rating themselves quite differently. Um, again, this pattern is similar across all three of these traits where these women leaders under 40 are rating themselves much, much lower than, than women leaders over 40. Um, so that, that's one kind of interesting finding that came to light. I think also if you pay attention to the directionality of the lines in these graphs, um, one of the things that, that is um, a, a pretty consistent pattern um, is that older women rate themselves more positively than their older male counterparts do. Uh, but younger women actually rate themselves much less positively than their younger male counterparts. And so that's just kind of a high-level overview summary of what we found when looking at self-perceptions. Um, so what happens, what did we find when we're looking at others' perceptions of these leaders? Uh, one thing that's interesting is where for self-perceptions we saw um, uh, a main effect for age, where younger leaders were rating themselves significantly lower than older leaders. We did not find this main effect for others' perceptions. So others are not, in fact, rating older and younger leaders differently. Um, we did find a main effect for gender, like we did for self-perceptions, but what's really interesting about this is that the direction has flipped. So for self-perceptions, female leaders were rating themselves lower than male leaders, but when we look at others' perceptions, female leaders are actually rating themselves significantly higher than male leaders on three of the four traits of the Denison model. Um, again, we see some interesting interactions here, so um, let me move to the graphs and kind of talk about what the interactions for others' perceptions are, are showing us. Um, again, we have women leaders on the left, men on the right. The dark blue line is for leaders over 40. Light blue line is for leaders under 40. Um, so some interesting things that stood out to me here um, first, if you look at the light blue line, so um, again, across all three graphs, this pattern is consistent, so I'm focusing only on, on the involvement graph in this example. Um, but this light blue line that I have circled here um, is the line for leaders under 40. And so if you see for leaders under 40, there's very few difference, there's very little difference between how men and women are rated. That line is actually pretty flat. Um, so others are rating younger leaders pretty consistently, regardless of whether they're, they're male or female. However, if you look at the dark blue line, which, which is our, our leaders that are over 40, um, there's a lot more slant to this line. Um, and particularly what that's showing us is that when we're looking just at leaders over 40, others are rating women um, as much, much higher than they're rating men. And so again, just some interesting patterns here. So there are a few things from these results that really stood out to me and seemed to possibly have important implications for leadership development. Um, first, younger leaders rate themselves less favorably than older leaders. And we don't see this from the other's perspective. So younger leaders are rating themselves less favorably. Others aren't necessarily rating younger leaders less favorably. Um, so to me, perhaps younger leaders could benefit from activities that boost their own self-confidence in their leadership skills and abilities. Um, and while this might be true for younger leaders in general, it may be particularly true for younger female leaders, as it's this demographic group, women under 40, who gave themselves the lowest ratings of any other demographic group that was investigated in this, in this study. Um, I think it's also interesting to note that while we don't see this from the self perspective, from the other's perspective, male leaders over 40 receive the lowest ratings of any other demographic group. Um, so perhaps this is indicating that this group of leaders is, uh, is maybe a little bit overconfident, or perhaps uh, it means that they're not paying as much attention to specifically developing their leadership skills and abilities. So I think that and, and behaviors are paying um, a lot of attention um, really to, to developing their role as leaders. And so this is another potential opportunity um, that, that I think is important to point out. Um, in addition, I thought it was really interesting um, that women over 40 
um, were rated more favorably than any other demographic group. And this was true for self-perceptions. It was true for others' perceptions. So more so than men over 40, more so than younger men, more so than younger women, women over 40 were, were rated most favorably. Um, so perhaps this is a really good group of leaders to utilize um, to gain knowledge or utilize in the, in the organization for things like peer coaching networks or other, or other such types of activities other such types of activities um, that, that would really harness what, what seems to be um, a, an interesting set of skills there. And so those are some kind of high-level conclusions and, and implications from this study. And with that, I'd like to kind of turn the presentation over to um, my colleague, Ashley Guidros, who is going to continue um, kind of debriefing some of, some of our more recent research findings. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, so continuing on with some of the research we've done in the R&D area, um, in the leadership area in particular, um, you know, we, Lindsay already talked about the interaction between gender and age. Um, gender is definitely a one demographic that um, people expect that there to be really great differences and big differences between how male versus female leaders uh, perform in the workplace. Um, but one thing that uh, is that is really interesting and, and something that we'll also talk about later in the culture performance research is the effect of the context that the leader works in. So in this study, we were particularly interested in the moderating effect of the industry that in order they, that a leader works in, particularly how gender um, balanced or male or female dominated it, the environment is. Um, so previous research has found that aspects of the work environment can make gender more salient, and that saliency can then enhance bias. So some studies have looked at uh, male-dominated environments and, I, and tried to examine the effect that that has on women's leadership ability and how they're perceived. Um, studies have looked at military, uh, financial services, and manufacturing. Um, some of these results have been uh, somewhat mixed, and some of them have found, found that women are are, do, are perceived to be as less effective leaders or have a more difficult time reaching the higher levels of leadership than in um, other environments. But one thing that is needed to kind of contribute to this literature, and this is where our study fits in, is to examine this effect uh, in a large field sample. And what that does is lets us look at effects across multiple industries, multiple organizations, and multiple job functions. So, you know, these effects could be found just be previous studies, for example, these results could have been found just because they were in the military or it was within one organization in a manufacturing setting. Um, and with, but it's hard to make generalizations from that research without being able to look at this across multiple organizations. So with our databases that we have available to us here at Denison, we're able to take a sample of leaders from multiple organizations, industries, et cetera, and, and be able to analyze those questions um, at a broader level. So particularly for this research project, we're interested in how males and females, male and female leaders would be rated um, in when they work in environments that are incongruent with their gender. So would a woman be rated lower than a male leader in a male-dominated industry? And would the same effect also happen for men working in female-dominated industries? So we randomly selected a sample of leaders. We controlled, we set a couple limitations. We just looked at leaders who were at line management levels or higher, um, leaders that had at least two years of tenure or more within their organization. And we limited our research to just people working within the United States. So we had a sample of, of almost 1,000 leaders um, rated by about 1,200 supervisors from over 100 organizations and across 19 different industries. So we used uh, data collected from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics to assign a percent female value to, to each industry. And what this does is tells us how many women are present within that work within that industry. So a range, this, in our sample, it ranged from 9.4% to 84.8%. Um, so 9.4% meaning that this is a very male-dominated environment. 84.8% um, is a very female-dominated environment. Uh, we used a, an analysis called hierarchical linear modeling. And it's a technique that lets us model relationships between ratings at multiple different levels. Um, and what we found was that for self-perceptions, we found both main effects 
uh, a main effect and an interaction for how leaders rate themselves on consistency, and we found a main effect for how leaders rate themselves on the adaptability uh, trait within the Denison leadership model. Um, and then from the boss's perspective, we found both main effects and interactions on how they rated leaders for on adaptability and mission. So what this looks like in a graph, or uh, graphically, is um, the as we see here, the left side of this graph is male-dominated industries, and the right side is female-dominated industries. Our red line is our female leaders, and our blue line is our male leaders. Um, we focus on uh, first, on the, the uh, leaders' self ratings of consistency, we see that in male-dominated environments, leaders aren't really rating themselves any differently, regardless if they're male or female. Their ratings are pretty much the same. But as we move into, as the industry becomes more female-dominated and more women are present in the environment, females are rating themselves higher and males are tending to rate themselves a little bit lower. We also see in the uh, ratings of leaders uh, ability on adaptability, that we have these, a downward trend for males ratings of themselves and an upward trend for females ratings of themselves. Um, so again, as the environment becomes more, uh, more imbalanced from one end to the other, we see a, um, I guess, an a enhancing effect for the person if they're working in a congruent environment to their gender. Looking at BOSS's ratings of adaptability and mission, we see the same pattern as we saw before. Um, again, very, but what's different here is very large differences in the, um, in the environments when they're very male-dominated versus female-dominated. So men in male-dominated environments are rated much higher by their BOSSes on their adaptability compared to women working in the same context. And the same thing was found for women working in female-dominated environments their bosses rate them much higher on the mission quadrant than men working in the same context. And again, we see these downward trends for males as the, as the industry gets more female dominated, males ratings uh, by others are, um, or males ratings by their bosses uh, decrease, and whereas females ratings by their bosses increase as the industry becomes more female dominated. So. We'll what does this look like when we talk about this in terms of the circumflex? So, you know, if you're working with leaders in a male or female dominated environment, this is some trend that you can, that this is kind of how this would look like. So I first want to point out that our female ratings are on the, the two left circumplexes and our male ratings are the two right circumplexes. The top two are our self ratings and the bottom two are our boss ratings. Um, so you can see that in a male dominated industry, which is what this slide is focusing on, leaders are uh, the male ratings tend to be out in the, in the high second to third quartile, so lots of ratings in the mid-50s to 60s, where we, the female ratings are in the low 40s, high 30s. Um, we also see, for, in particular, strategic direction and intent. Um, males rate themselves uh, around the 64th percentile, whereas females rate themselves around the 38th percentile. That's nearly 30 point difference. Um, same thing with the bosses ratings. Uh, women are, are rated around the 36th percentile for customer focus. Uh, men in the same environment are rated around the 58th percentile, so about a 22 point difference there. When we look at the same results in fe or looking at a sample of leaders from female dominated industries, again the patterns shift. So leader, the female circumflexes on the left are much higher in the third quartile. Uh, males' ratings are lower in the, the 40s or third, excuse me, low 40s to mid 30s. Um, so, for uh, but one thing that was kind of interesting here is we see that men and women rate themselves uh, the same on works to reach agreement in the in both in the female-dominated environment. Excuse me, but um, are but rate themselves much lower than their female counterparts on defining core values and works to reach agreement. We also see that the mission quadrant in particular are there large differences between men and women here where women are rated an average of 25 percentile points higher than their male counterparts in the same setting. 
So some conclusions and implications for development. Um, one in particular is that we, this does provide some impact or some support to the idea that the context or the environment that leaders work in can affect how they're perceived. And we found that female leaders tend to rate themselves higher and are rated higher by others in female-dominated environments and vice versa for males in male-dominated environments. So one question that we're trying to answer here, and we still don't have an answer for um, quite yet, but if you have any suggestions, we welcome them, is trying to understand if there is a female boost for women when they work around women. Um, is, it, is it the case that uh, women, when women are in female-dominated environments, there may be more examples of how women should behave or how women should lead, and therefore it's, uh, their leadership ability is actually better in that setting, or is it that um, with more females in the environment, there are um, the tendency or the the type of work that is done in those settings um, of female leadership style may be more appreciated than a male leadership style. So moving on, I'd like to discuss our next study, which is looking at culture and performance. Um, culture and performance is something that we've done quite a bit of research here at Identis and Linking. Uh, organizational culture to a number of different performance metrics and how and organizational performance across a number of different aspects. Um, in particular, this study we were looking at the volatility of the business environment. So uh, there's a theory, our researchers have theorized that organizations that work in environments that are a little bit more volatile will, um, you know, have to be responding to more change or, um, or be uh, provided or presented with more challenges than organizations that work in more stable business environments. So in this, in particular in this study, we're looking at the balance between the left side of the model and the right side of the model. So um, as you see, we have these points here where the top half is the external model, external side of culture, and the bottom half is internal. The left side is flexible. So the traits of adaptability and involvement are considered to be flexible aspects of organizational culture that organizations can change and adapt to use to respond to the marketplace. Whereas mission and consistency are more stable aspects of culture, these are things that um, tend to not change very much over time. And once a vision is established, uh, long-term strategy is articulated and short-term goals are, are set to meet that long-term strategy. And, and, and organizations are in need of um, strong internal processes with the uh, agreement and coordination to make sure that they meet those, the, the uh, vision of the company. Um, but, but researchers have theorized that um, the relationship between the um, being high on the flexible side of the model might be advantageous for organizations that work in highly volatile industries. So if you work in a setting where you are uh, in an environment where there's a lot of change, there's a lot of things happening, there's a lot of uh, stress and, and challenges to the organization on a, maybe on a daily or even monthly basis, then being high in adaptability and involvement, being able to react well to the marketplace and best utilize your, the talents of your employees will make, should have a, a positive impact on organizational performance in those types of settings. On the flip side, um, when the environments are less volatile and more stable, uh, having a strong consistency and mission culture should actually positively impact organizational performance. So we used a, about 137 organizations that are publicly traded that we, um, they're from about 30 different industries. This data was collected over the last 10 years. And we collected uh, financial data from the CompuStat. Uh, we used return on assets. And also, we calculated a composite of financial performance called Tobin's Q. And we used this uh, information to measure the effect of organizational performance on, uh, excuse me, organizational culture on performance. Well, what we found was that there was no difference between culture and performance for organizations in stable versus volatile industries. So what this looks like is um, on the, the second plex on the left are organizations in a low volatility environment. The second plex on the right are organizations in a high volatility environment. Um, as you can see, for the most part, their culture scores are ranging between the 40, mid-40s to low-50th percentile 
um, low volatility organizations are increasing out into the third percentile a little bit here and there, but for the most part, their differences are really small, um, you know, maybe four to five points higher than their uh, counterparts in high volatile industries. But what we see on the bottom of this of this or of these circumplexes are their average return on assets are pretty similar across both industries, and Tobin's Q is also very similar across both industries. So these so or um, so some conclusions we can draw from this is that we didn't find any evidence of a contingent interaction between culture and volatility. And although intuition seems to suggest that flexibility will be really advantageous in a volatile environment, um, what might be better here is the is having a culture balance. So it doesn't necessarily mean that um, that focusing on one aspect of culture, one side of the model will benefit an organization in the long run, what is probably most needed is a strong culture overall that can help the organization succeed uh, and adapt to both the times when the environment is really volatile and the times when business flows and things become a little more stable. So at that point, I would like to conclude and see if we have any questions. Um, here is Lindsay's contact information if you do have any immediate questions you'd like answered. And Karen, do you have anything for us? Thank you both for the uh, for that great presentation. So we do have some questions that have come in. And I think that I'm going to start with some of the questions that are more about the research project um, as opposed to what the research department can do for us, since those are a little more fresh in our minds. Um, one of our, our listeners uh, was thinking about the um, the implication, some of the development implications of the first leadership survey or the first leadership project, research project, and, and some of the development implications and what it meant for the leaders over 40. Um, and he asks, um, is it possible that the leaders over 40 are actually receiving less or lower quality feedback of their performance, uh, maybe for political reasons or things like that, and that's why they're getting those lower scores? I think I definitely think that is possible. Um, I think that, that that's a really good point. Um, we're we're not, you know, 100% sure what the the mechanisms behind that are. I think the important conclusion or takeaway is that perhaps that those those male leaders over 40 um, should be paying more attention to or should have more attention paid to developing their leadership skills and abilities. So you know, it could be that they are receiving less feedback and less attention um, because it perhaps assumes that you know they should know how to be a leader and they should know how to do their job um, or it's perhaps they the leaders themselves aren't paying as much attention to their leadership skills it, it could be either um, you know we're not sure if it's, it's an organizational influence or the leaders themselves um, you know kind of causing that that um, lack of understanding or I guess um, lack of focus but I think that either way, the, the conclusion or the implication, I think, is the same that that is, um, I think the research shows is an important um, group of individuals for, um, that should receive more attention um, and more attention should be paid to developing their leadership skills and abilities and, and behaviors um, and just generally developing their role as leaders in the organization. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, Jumping to the second of the leadership studies, um, one of our, our listeners is asking, in the, the more male-dominated industries, were, did we, were we able to look at or did we notice any differences in the perceptions of the ratings of men if the boss was a woman or vice versa? Did we take into account the gender of the boss rating the person? Now, in this study, we did not. Um, we were just focusing on um, the ratings of the leader, we weren't focusing on, excuse me, we were just focusing on the gender of the leader. We weren't focusing on the gender of the raters. Um, I think that is an interesting study, and that is something we've looked at in other settings, not particularly in this study. And Lindsay, I think you've done some work in that area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's, that, that is something that we have talked a little bit about, and I, I would say that I've kind of done some playing around with our data and the numbers, but haven't yeah. really... Um, developed the idea or, de or developed the research. My initial playing around, um, I actually d 
don't find much in terms mm -hmm. of um, the gender of the raider um, mm -hmm. having an impact. Um, but again, this you know I, I want to put a big kind of asterisk next to my saying that because this is just kind of um, the initial um, uh, looking around that I've kind of done in the data. And so you know it's, it's definitely worth a closer look and I think a really important and interesting question um, that you know we should definitely pay attention to. Right. Uh, this is kind of a, a more general question that um, has, have we done any research on the relationship um, on the competency profiles of the leaders themselves and the organizational culture and the organizational performance? So the combination of the leadership and the organizational culture performance. Mm -hmm. um, well, we've done a little bit looking at that and we find that as um, I haven't looked specifically like if they're high on these three traits or if these three indexes, well, how will that relate to culture and vice versa? Um, that's, we're kind of in the preliminary area of doing this research, and it's something that we find to be very interesting. It's also very challenging um, to link up the culture and leadership just because of the way the projects sometimes are run. But there does seem to be an impact, and we have recently released a research note, uh, I think the last quarter, talking about uh, profiles of leaders and how their leader behavior um, matches with the culture of the organization. Mm -hmm. And just to follow up on that a little bit, I think um, the research note that is available on the web that's you know, one of our more recently research or released research notes um, does go through some of our preliminary findings and kind of linking culture and leadership. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't um, tie in directly, um, you know, a, a performance metric to, metric to that. But that's something that we want to expand on and, and do more of. Um, and again, this is that the research you know, just kind of our, our preliminary research in that area. As Ashley mentioned, it's it's kind of a, a difficult area to do research in, and we are just kind of starting to build up a large enough sample size of organizations that have utilized both our leadership tool and our culture tool, and have done so in a way that those that leaders can be meaningfully matched to particular areas um, of the organization. So in order to do the research, we have to know, um, you know, which which area of the organization, um, you know, which group, which department does each leader belong to, so that we can match them in a meaningful way to do the research, which can somewhat can sometimes be a little bit tricky. Um, and another thing, just to kind of mention on that front, is um, I am currently submitting to um, the, the SIOP conference, so hopefully we'll be presenting some research along these lines um, at the next SIOP conference in April that looks at whether the fit or congruence between um, the, the leader's strengths and weaknesses and the culture's strengths and weaknesses, whether that fit is important to effectiveness or whether it's actually misfit that's important to, to effectiveness. So do you want um, is it leaders who have the, the same skill sets and traits that are seen in the culture? Is, is that what is perceived as more effective? Or when leaders are more complementary, um, so they have strengths on the flexible side when the culture is strong on the, uh, on the stable side, is, is, that, is it that complementary fit that um, is, is perceived as being more effective? Um, and so that's research I'm just kind of starting and, and hoping to you know, submit and be presenting at next year's conference. Great, thank you. I wanted to turn now to a couple of the couple of questions that have more to do with um, the services that research offers. Um, we've had a few questions come in about um, what are some of the more common performance metrics that we work with clients to study. I think that's a that's a really good question, and um, you know, unfortunately, a kind of a, a researchy answer is it depends. <laughs> um, but, but really what, what we like to do is um, sit down and have conversations with our clients about um, what is it that you pay attention to in your organization? You know, what's the pain you're facing? What's the problem you're trying to fix? So you know, do you have a, a turnover problem that, that is really difficult? Are you particularly interested in um, sustainability right now? Is that an important initiative for your organization? How do you measure the performance of your organization and the performance of individuals in your organization. And based on what we learn from that, we talk about what might be um, you know, the, the best metrics to look at to do this kind of research. Um, 
and to do it in a way that it's going to have the most impact and the most meaning for organizations. So, um, you know, again, it really depends. We've looked at things from customer satisfaction to safety to, um, you know, as the, the one example I presented today, EBITDA, which is a financial performance metric. Um, and, you know, we've, we've worked with a, a construction company whose the metric that was important to them was how many boards, literally wood boards, were produced um, at different sites um, on an hourly basis. And so, you know, that was the metric that was important to them. And so um, we think it's really important to gain an understanding of what the organization is facing, what they're trying to accomplish, and determine, you know, the metrics that are important to look at from there. Um, we also talked about how we, the research department helps organizations do a lot of mapping. Um, do, is that mapping strictly to um, other surveys like uh, OCI or Q12 or places to work, or do we work with in-house um, surveys that they've created on their own? It's, it's definitely both. Um, we've done mapping projects with, um, uh, you know, engagement, other um, uh, readily available um, surveys that are put out by, you know, different, different companies like the OCI and things like that, but have also worked um, with in-house developments and have, and have done that mapping as well. So it's been both. Okay. Um, here's a, a good one, an age-old question that we hear. Um, is there a good rule of, of thumb if you're trying to decide on whether um, a census is a viable option or a sample is a viable option when uh, serving an organization? Mm -hmm. There's, there's not necessarily a rule of thumb. There's a lot of important things to consider. So, you know, first of all, if you're deciding to do a, a sample over a census, um, I think it's important to pay close attention to the potential um, political ramifications um, that that might have. So, um, you know, you might be asking everybody to make change based on the results, but you didn't necessarily ask for everybody's opinion um, in contributing to the results. And even though the results are uh, statistically valid, um, there's there, there's something about that that might just not feel right or sit right with employees in the organization. It can also be difficult to have, um, you know, someone in an office next to you say, oh, how did you like that survey we just took? And, and then, you know, your response is, what survey? I, I didn't get invited to take that. So, um, you know, there's, there's some things to keep in mind, um, but with important communication, some of those political considerations can be overcome. Um, and then really just it's important to take a look at how are you going to look at your data and your results? Um, you know, what departments, what levels of the organization um, are you going to be looking at and to make sure to craft a um, sampling plan that will ensure that you have um, valid and representative results at every single one of those levels. Um, and uh, probably the most basic rule of thumb that I can give is that the smaller the population of the, of the group, the larger the percent of the population that's required to have a, have a valid sample. So a lot of times sampling plans don't make sense um, unless we're talking about, you know, really large organizations. So there's really a lot of things that the research department can help with, from mapping to sampling to um, studying those uh, very important research questions. Um, are very important uh, performance metrics questions for organizations. Uh, in terms of cost, what do we tend to do with organizations in creating projects like this? Mm -hmm. um, cost is really on a case-by-case -case basis. And so, um, you know, similar to my, my answer for the performance metrics is we really have to understand every project that we do um, in the R&D department is is pretty much different from the last one that we did mm -hmm. um, because it's all based on you know what the client needs and what's going to be useful and important for the client. And so, you know, understanding um, it, the deliverable is often dif different as well. So sometimes you know a, a technical report is what's useful for a client. Sometimes a PowerPoint presentation is what use, is useful for a client. Sometimes both of those things are what's useful for a client. And and so. Um, there's a lot of things that factor in, you know, what are we actually doing, what's the deliverable that's going to be helpful, um, a lot of things that kind of factor in um, to kind of creating a, 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 a price for the project. So, mm -hmm. so we, 
in essence, we work together with the organization to create what the organization needs to help them. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, it looks like we are at our time, so I thank both Lindsay and Ashley, and we really appreciate you both being here um, today and sharing what you do every day with us. Um, for those of you listening out there, I would encourage you to uh, contact us if you'd like to learn more or if you'd like to follow up with either of them. Um, I wanted to let you know about our next webinar, which is going to be Wednesday, September 22nd. We're going to be joined by Karen Jones of the National Health Service of the United Kingdom. She's going to uh, talk with us about how the, the how NHS used the organizational culture survey to help create alignment uh, with their strategy and their employees. Uh, so keep an eye out for more information on that. We will be sending it an email to all of you. Uh, inviting you to that very soon. Once again, we really appreciate you all taking the time to be with us today, and we look forward to having you join us on a future webinar. Thank you, and have a great day.